Welcome guys to another episode of Buy and Hold. I'm your host, Thick Teddy. Today we're going to be talking about Plug, aka Plug Power. Uh, and I want to say thank you guys for tuning into this video. I enjoy making these so much because I'm a fundamental guy when it comes to trading. Um, so please, you know, drop a like, subscribe to the channel, you know, tune in next week. Drop a comment of a, of a stock you want to see me talk about. My cat is on my desk. Get down, bud. All right, so so let's get into Plug Power here. This is a company that, that they sell hydrogen fuel solutions, and we're going to talk a lot about what they do as a company later. But first, let's talk about the technicals and what levels, if you're long on this or feeling like you would like to be long on this, what levels are you going to be looking at buying in at? So we can see that this tops completely... When is that? January 21st, nope, January 25th of 2021 at $75. And right now we're sitting at about $17. So massive decrease in price, massive decrease in share price. There was a top again at $46, a top here at $32, and then another top here right below $32. And we're sitting at $17.20. So we're at a pretty hefty de discount, sorry, Sometimes words just don't work right, you know? Um, pretty hefty discount here, comparative to tops in the past, comparative to all-time high. If we go all the way back to 2020 before the crazy market began, this was sitting at right about $2.70. Uh, $2.90. And then right at 2020, the flip, it was $5 a share. So we've had an increase in the past three years, but we've also seen a steady decline in the past two years. So. Levels that I would be looking at buying this if I was a long on this. The first one would definitely be right below $17. My line is right about uh, $16.50, and that's where I would feel pretty comfortable having a starter position in here, considering uh, that's been a place where it's you know bounced around quite a bit. There's been a few bottoms near it. There's been a few tops near it. It's had a lot of candle movement. I feel like that's a good spot to get a starter in and be ready to average down on the rest of these. The next level I have is right under 14. It's 1377 is this level here. And that comes from this bottom here, this bottom here, uh, these two tops, this third top, and then this other bottom back in 2020. So there's been multiple touches of that level, and I feel like it's a pretty a pretty solid level to, to think about buying in. This one is 1050. So we've gone all the way from $16 to 1050. That's a big decrease. That's a big probably waiting period between between buying and selling or between buying each of those legs. So 1050 comes from back in July of 2020 when there was this top and then these bottoms in August of 2020 and September of 2020. And the last leg, which, you know, I say this often, sometimes the last leg doesn't hit, don't expect it to hit, but you want to make sure you have it there in case this goes lower than you think, is 766 or 750-ish, wherever you want to call that. And that comes from this bottom in July of 2020. I feel like that's a good bottoming level because at that point, that's, that's your final ad. You're going to have a position somewhere between um, $10 and $13. So you're going to have like an 11, 12 average. That's a pretty good number to have on a, on a company like this after buying in at 17. And I don't really think that, that you can go wrong on something long as a technical perspective if you've averaged down from 17 to, to 11. Um, if you believe in the company long term, which is what we're going to talk about next. So let's move to the, the Finviz here. The market cap is almost $9 billion. I can't imagine what the market cap was when this thing was, was over 70 bucks. Income is minus 700 million. That's a problem that we're going to have to talk about. Sales are 642 million. So they're burning their sales plus their, their, their negative 693 million. So sales plus that is what they're burning. Book per share is about 731, which isn't bad for, for a future um, kind of leading company like this. Cash per share is 450. Not bad at all, actually. I actually like that cash per share considering this is a company who's burning a lot of a lot of cash as they as they continue down the road of trying to turn profitable. Employees 2500 um, or a little bit below 2450. I like that as well. Quick ratio 520, current ratio 610. That's really good. It's a little bit too good maybe. Um, I'm interested in why it's that high. Debt to equity ratio, LT debt to equity ratio both average good. Um, price to book 2.1, not bad at all. Price to cash is 3.5, not bad at all. I kind of actually like that price per cash. Price to sales is 13.9. We don't like that. We don't like to see that on a company like this. And then they don't even get a PE ratio because they have no income. It's negative. So 
PS is a little bit high for me right now. That's why we have those average downs a little bit lower. I feel like this um, personally needs to probably see a PS ratio of below 10. And I think I'd be very, very much more comfortable thinking about even taking a starter if we get that PS ratio below 10. EPS this year is up 51%. We like to see that. We like a growing company. Their margins, really bad. We don't even need to look at those. Margins, bad. Insider ownership is only 0.8%. I'm interested as to why that's only 0.8%. And, and institutions have 60%, which is pretty, pretty decent. Institutional transactions up 9.4% in the past three months. That's what we like to see. We like to see institutions buying. We don't want to see them selling. We like to see them buying. Insiders, I'm, I'm kind of concerned why you're not buying. If, if institutions are taking such a large position chunk and adding it, then why are insiders not doing the same? Let's look at this. 52-week range here, we have $11.50 to $32. You know, pretty big range there. So a lot of room for you to get, get average downs in before this possibly reaches or tests highs again, that sort of thing. Average price target is $28.70. So that's about a... Uh, I don't know. I'm not good at math, but $11 per share raise. So can't go wrong there. Analysts usually, you know, those price targets are, are a little bit outlandish sometimes, but we like to see the target price be above the current price. Usually, <laughs> uh, most of the time it is. I'm interested in this current and uh, quick ratio. I'm gonna have to do some more digging on that after the video, but that's something that you guys could look into as well. Maybe just see why those are so high. But biggest thing you guys need to see here is the income is, is minus $690 million. That's a pretty big red flag when it comes to investing in companies and believing in them moving forward. If you actually feel like they're going to be able to, to flip that into uh, positive income, then uh, different story. But right now it's a little bit of a tough sell considering their sales are only 640 and their income is minus 693 million. So that's a tough sell for me. That's something that I'd be probably interested in swinging, but I would not be interested in investing based on that income number being that low. And them also having you know quite a bit of cash and I'm wondering what they're doing and I'm wondering all these questions and I don't really have answers for them based on these numbers here. So I'm a little bit interested in, in, in what's going on and their income. Why is it so negative? Why are you guys having such an issue just being you know somewhere around the, the you know, minus 150, minus 200 million. Why is it minus 700 million? I'm interested in why it's so, it's it's so low there. It's such a large deficit. Their margins are just that bad, or is their management that bad? Is there, uh, you know, are, or are they just expanding a ton? I'm interested in that. And personally, uh, for me, I think it's a mixture of both. I think they're expanding a lot, doing a lot of stuff. But I also kind of think they're they're a little bit mismanaged in there. Their margins aren't quite working out the way that they should be for a company that has the partners that they do, which we're going to talk about later as well. Let's get into what this company is. So this will give us kind of an overview and also introduce us to the CEO. So Andy Marsh is the CEO. He joined Plug as president and CEO in April 2008. Under his leadership, Plug is a leading innovator in the renewable energy field, helping to create the first commercially viable market for green hydrogen and fuel cell technology, HFC. After successful endeavors to commercialize HFC technology in the material handling industry, customers such as Amazon and Walmart turned to Plug Power to develop world-class hydrogen solutions that solve every step of operations, with led, which led Plug to build an end-to-end green hydrogen ecosystem. With the ecosystem, Plug provides production, storage, and handling, delivery, transportation, and dispensing of hydrogen to allow its customers to meet their business goals and decarbonize the economy. As president and CEO, Mr. Marsh plans and directs all aspects of the company's goals and objectives and is focused on building a company that leverages Plug's combination of technolo technological expertise, talented people, and focus on sales growth to continue the company's leadership stance in the future energy economy. Under his leadership, Plug's revenue increased by more than 296% since 2012 and has landed Plug on Deloitte's techno technology fast 500 TM list in both 2015 and 2016. That number of 296 kind of seemed like a flash word considering that's 11 years in a highly, highly uh, future focused, should be, should be increasing faster than that sector in my opinion. This sort of a, of a sector and this sort of a company, I believe, should be, should be increasing their margins a bit better than that and their revenues should be increasing quite a bit more than 290% since 2012. If we were to look into, you know, companies that are uh, like charge point type companies that are electric vehicle charging instead of hydrogen, 
um, vehicle, then I think we might see higher numbers than 296%. Maybe I'm wrong there, but I believe we'd probably see higher numbers in those, those electric vehicle charging, considering how that's blown up in the past few years. Let's go to their customers. So this is a big, a big kind of step for this company is, is the customers. Boeing, NASA, BMW, Home Depot, Whole Foods, Amazon, AT&T, CSX, um, Walmart, FedEx. Those are the big names we see here. And, and those are big names for the company to have and be able to, to advertise as their partners. And those are also going to be big customers moving forward. I know Amazon and Walmart and FedEx, absolutely massive when it comes to the material handling business uh, side of side of plug power. You know, they have I don't know how many forklifts they have. I don't know how many just electronic jacks they have, but uh, all of those are, are are being looked towards possibly becoming alternate energy. So if 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 plug power can gain all of those or, or partial of those contracts for those warehouses and all of that sort of stuff, then they have a good shot at, at increasing their their revenues and their sales quite a bit. But these having these people on board already is pretty big deal. Having these people on board is, is it legitimizes the company first. And then it also just kind of gives um, investors a bit more of a, a bullish sentiment considering Amazon, Walmart, FedEx are on board, NASA, Boeing, all these companies are on board with them. That's pretty big for, for plug power. So you can know that this is a real company. Like we can we can know that we're not dealing with a Nikola here. We can know that we're not dealing with a, a crappy, terrible company who's gonna you know pull the wool over our eyes, AKA Nikola. But we can, we can figure out the, a little bit more deeply about them based on these partnerships if we were to explore them a little bit, but I don't have enough time in this video to obviously go into what Amazon is planning to do with plug power, what Walmart and FedEx are planning to do, but you can know that they're a legit company from this. Here's their investor letter where it talks about their their earnings and what they plan for for the the years in the in the future. So Plug reports 188.6 million in revenue in quarter three 2022, up 31% year over year. I like that 31% year over year. I do enjoy that. I think that's a pretty good number. Um, it reaffirms recently updated 2022 guidance and projects for 2023 and beyond. And I wanna I wanna kind of uh, talk for a second that 300 level that I was saying that 300% increase in the past 11 years um, to me. The reason I thought that that should have been higher, and I'm also the reason that I feel like 31% right now is okay, is because of how big they are now. When you're a small company and you're just beginning, you can run your you can run your your year over years into the hundreds. You can run your year over years in above 50, above 60, above 70. So I'm wondering why back in 2012, when they were such a small company, why they weren't able to run those run those up those year over years a bit more. Um, and then when you become a larger company, usually your year over years decrease, and they become a little bit more stable. And you're not growing as fast because you're such a large company. So that's why I'm okay with 31% now. But I'm I'm kind of questioning what happened back in 2012 to 2018. When you know you could have been running those up really, really quickly because you're a fast-growing company in a fast-growing sector. So that's why I'm interested in that. But I'm okay with this 31%. Uh, and they also reaffirmed their 2022 guidance and projections for 2023 and beyond. So let's let's talk about those. 2023 revenue target of 1.4 billion represents annual growth over 65% with plans to exit this year with operating break-even margin. Interesting. So they're they're looking for break-even on that 1.4 billion, which that would be in line with about how much they, they spent this year based on their sales and then their income difference. Um, 1.4 billion break even, they break even by the end of the year, that investment that you made at, at you know, 13, 14 bucks is gonna be quite a bit higher if they break even by the end of the year. If they can run with 2023 and actually execute 1.4 billion, and an annual growth of 65% and you know break even on that, then you guys are gonna have a pretty good return on investment there. Uh, let's see what else they say. Our unparalleled industry position and strategic initiatives position us to be on track to deliver our 2026 and 2030 revenue targets of 5 billion and 20 billion and operating margin targets of 17% and 22% respectively. So 2026, that's three years from now. They're looking at five bill in revenue. In 2030, 20 bill in revenue. I assume some of those are contracts they're expecting they're going to pick up or contracts that they have secured that they're expecting to uh, produce heavily for them in those 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 couple of year spans. That's interesting, and that's also pretty pretty decent for investors. The only thing is, is you know they can revise this any earnings report, and they could cut that 1.4 to 0.8. You know, who knows what they're going to do? They could cut that five bill to two bill. They could cut that 20 bill to 10 bill. Who knows what they're going to do? But if they revise that and something bad like that happens, then you're probably going to get burned on your investment because that's them showing you that they're not feeling uh, as bullish on their own company and on their numbers as they were in the past. So 
These are great numbers. The fact that they, they reaffirmed them is also great. Institutional ownership. There's only one thing on this page I really wanted to highlight. The, the people who have the largest positions in this, it starts with BlackRock, then Vanguard, then Voya Investment Management, then Vanguard again, then Vanguard again, uh, then Paribas BNP, and then Morgan Stanley, and then Glee, Clean Energy ETF and Geode Capital Management. So those are some big names. I like those names. I don't have a whole lot to talk about this, but I do like seeing that these companies are investing in plug power. Let's talk about their competitors and, and how they're feeling about this. So this is about Musk talking about how, how stupid he believes hydrogen cars are. And I'm just going to read this to you guys aloud. Tesla and its competitors in the battery-powered... Wait, did I, did I start that right? Yeah. Tesla's and its competitors in the battery-powered electric vehicle market dominate debate over who will control the future of cars. But there's another kind of green transportation technology making inroads in the United States. And it's based on the most abundant resource in the universe. Fuel cell electric vehicles combine hydrogen stored in a tank with oxygen from the air to produce electricity with water vapor as the byproduct. Unlike more common battery-powered electric vehicles, fuel cell vehicles don't need to be plugged in, and current models all exceed 300 miles of range on a fuel tank. On a full tank, they're filled up with a nozzle almost as quickly and traditional as traditional gas and diesel vehicles. While fuel cell vehicles themselves only emit water vapor from their tailpipes, the Union of Concerned Scientists notes that by producing hydrogen can lead to pollution. Though renewable sources of hydrogen such as agricultural and waste sites are increasing, the majority of the hydrogen sourced for fuel comes from traditional natural gas extraction. Still, the impact is still less than gasoline-powered counterparts. So, essentially, Musk is a bit scared of what can happen from this, but he also believes it's it's not a not an issue. And why does he believe it's not an issue? I'm pretty I'm pretty certain it's based on the infrastructure. I'm pretty certain that it's based on what he's seen in the statistics of growth of hydrogen fuel, um, you know, filling stations versus his EV charging stations, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But there's also something here to to note as well is you know their the impact is less than their gasoline powered counterparts. Uh, I'd like to see some more some more numbers on you know EV versus these hydrogen powered cars, but a lot of this revenue from plug power is going to be coming out of out of warehouses, out of you know um, mechanical stuff rather than you know vehicles on the street, which a lot of people just want to see vehicles on the street. That's what you see every day. There's a lot of money to be made behind the scenes, so don't count plug power out because of this. Don't count them out because they're probably not going to have the largest scene of, of cars driving on the street using their technology but do know that that is going to kind of be a deficit for them it's probably not as many cars on the street using plug power technology more stuff behind the scenes more stuff at amazon warehouses more stuff at walmart warehouses that sort of stuff is going to be where where this this is probably going to have its have its most footing and probably the best contracts that they're going to make the most money on is going to be behind the scenes so let's talk about why I think Musk is, is, is calling this stupid and why he's confident that hydrogen is not going to become a big thing in the United States. So the first thing is, is let's look at the amount of fuel, hydrogen fuel stations by type in the United States. Uh, this started in 2019. I checked the 2021 numbers, and this is about in line with what, they're, what, they, what they were, and then the forecast until 2030. So in 2019, there was, there was 120 material handling fueling stations and 63 uh, large fueling stations. And then in 2022, there were about 465 uh, combined. I believe that number was a bit larger. It was like 500 or something. I can't remember exactly. And then in 2025, the projections are 1600. And then in 2030, the projections are right about, what is that? 5,800. So 5,800 in total in 2030. And let's look at the, the difference between EV charging stations. So EV charging stations, currently the U.S. has about 140 public EV chargers distributed across 53 charging stations. So 53,000 charging stations, which are still outnumbered by the 145 gas fueling stations in the country. So 153 electric vehicle, 100, sorry, 53,000 charging stations for electric vehicles right now versus... In 2030, seven years from now, a projected 5,800, 5,800, seven years from now versus the current 53,000 that electric vehicles have. That's an issue, very large issue. Like I said, a lot of the stuff is going to be happening behind the scenes for plug power. A lot of stuff is going to be happening in places that the modern, you know, the normal um, guy who doesn't have a blue collar job is not going to see. Um, 
you know, people in the blue collar workforce are probably going to be seeing a lot more of plug power products, uh, which I worked in a warehouse for years. Um, and I probably, you know, maybe I'd be seeing it in a couple of years. Maybe I'd be seeing it next year. I have a buddy who one of my best friends works at an Amazon warehouse. Um, and so maybe he's going to be seeing it soon and I'm going to be asking him about it. I'll, I'll show you that. But until they can close their margins and until they can figure out a, a way to be break even, I don't personally feel comfortable so, um, investing in this. So it's going to be just a, a watch for me. It'll be on my long-term watch list because if they can do what they, th they say they're going to do in 2023, then, um, then I'll be interested in investing in them for sure. But until then, I'm going to be watching from the sidelines. I want to see see how hydrogen goes uh, in the public's eyes. I want to see how the public reacts to hydrogen, how that sort of stuff happens. Uh, but my cat came back up here to say goodbye to everybody. So um, thank you guys for tuning in. Again, obviously, I hope you guys uh, have a good, you know, have a good rest of your week. And, and I hope you guys learned something from this video. So uh, thanks for watching. And I will catch you guys next week. Peace out, guys.